thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It is a real privilege for me to be here tonight and to speak to you all. Um, I'm especially glad for the invitation for two reasons. Uh, one, it is true that I'm always happy to come back to New World. It uh, is a very special place for me and, uh, and I'm always glad to come back. And uh, secondly, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to go back to the field of linguistics, even if just for, for a short time. Um, what was intended to be just a short affair <laughs> with theology turned into a marriage. <laughs> so <laughs> the truth is I don't, uh, I don't uh, work, I don't study, I don't teach anymore um, um, in the field of linguistics. So this um, opportunity really gave me a chance to, to go back and do some reading and do some thinking. And, uh, and um, I, I have to say I found this study and the preparation process uh, very thought stimulating. And, uh, and I'm hoping it won't be the last time when I can uh, um, combine or explore the connections between the two disciplines of studied uh, linguistics and theology. I would like to start um, with a quotation. It is by an acknowledged uh, novelist, Alice Walker, and um, it is taken from her um, award-winning, uh, best-selling novel, The Color Purple. And, uh, and I won't make any comments uh, on that quote now, but I'll come back to it in the end of my talk, and I hope that by that time it will make sense why I chose, uh, chose uh, to start with this um, quotation. So here's a scene from that book, and um, the scene really is that there are two ladies, two black ladies, uh, talking to each other, and uh, that's what it says. Here's the thing, say Shug, the thing I believe. God is inside you and inside everybody else. You come into the world with God, but only them that search for it inside find it. And sometimes it just manifests itself even if you're not looking or don't know what you're looking for. Trouble do it for most folk, I think. Sorrow, Lord. It? I asked. Yeah, it. God ain't a he or a she, but a it. But what do it look like? I asked. Don't look like nothing, she say. It ain't a picture show. It ain't something you can look at apart from everything else, including yourself. I believe God is everything, say Shug. Everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you found it. Well, us talk and talk about God, but I'm still adrift, trying to chase that old white man out of my head. I've been so busy thinking about him, I never truly noticed nothing God make. Not a plate of corn, not the color purple, not the little white flowers, nothing. Now that my eyes opening, I feels like a fool. Man corrupt everything, say Shug. He in your head, and all over the radio, he tried to make you think he everywhere. Soon as you think he everywhere, you think he God. But he ain't. Whenever you try to pray, and man plop himself on the other end of it. Tell him to get lost, say Shag. Conjure up flowers, wind, water, a big rock. Alice Walker. Um, tonight I would like to talk about language. Language is um, a uniquely human gift or a human phenomenon and uh, it's absolutely central to our experience as human beings. Appreciating ro the role of language in constructing our mental lives helps us to understand ourselves and to understand the complexity of human interaction with each other and with the outside world. So tonight we're going to think about language and we're going to consider the connection between the world on one hand, how we see it, how we interpret it, um, and our language on the other hand. And at first the connection seems rather straightforward um, and it's really something that we don't go around thinking about. Um, we just use language, we do it reflexively and uh, we do it without pondering on its 
deeper connection with the outside world. But beneath the surface, which we sometimes only think uh, when we um, encounter communicational problems, when we realize that um, people using different languages mean different things, or even people um, who speak the same language uh, can sometimes mean completely uh, different things. I think you know, married people can think of an example or two. Beneath the surface of language, really, there really is a very complicated and very fascinating world um, linguists are interested in. And um, the area of linguistics which um, is especially interested in how our mind and world influence each other, um, how our mind works and how we come up with lexical, grammatical structures um, using our cognitive capacity um, this area of linguistics is called cognitive linguistics and that's the area I would like to focus on tonight. It's a quite a large branch of linguistics. Um, it has become more and more popular over maybe over uh, 20 last years or so. And in a nutshell its main idea is that um, whatever universal principles we, we find in languages um, they are eventually rooted in cognition in our ability to experience the world through our bodies and through our senses. And I would like us to consider some of cognitive linguistics findings today and see if they have or whether they might have anything to do with God or the way we understand him. And just to be clear, um, I'm not here to give any answers, quite the contrary. Um, Actually, I would like to encourage us tonight and stimulate our thinking and, and ask some questions concerning, uh, concerning the way we use our language. When we um, deal with cognitive linguistics, uh, there we soon encounter a theory of uh, linguistic relativity. Linguistic relativity is a theory which um, is especially concerned with the relationship between language and thinking and uh, it consists of two basic notions. First that languages are relative, um, that they vary in their expression on, of concepts in noteworthy ways. Um, we don't know exactly how many languages there are out there, uh, they're dying quite fast, um, English is taking over. Um, but uh, roughly there are about 6,000 languages and um, it's a simple fact that they differ from one another. Um, and I think anyone who speaks more than just one language can come up with some examples of uh, how languages are different. And the second notion of linguistic rel relativity is that um, the linguistic expression of concepts has influence over conceptualization in cognitive domains. Or to put it in other words, um, our linguistic expression influences to some extent the way we think. And the question that rises here is quite obvious. If languages can be strikingly different, um, and if the way we speak actually shapes our thinking, does it mean that speakers of different languages end up thinking about the world um, and seeing it and in some extent experiencing the world, experiencing the world um, in different ways. Do we think differently because of our lingual differences or do we think uh, the same way and notice things the same way but only talk differently? That question was asked and uh, the theory of linguistic relativism came to be in 1930s and um, it's mainly associated with two um, American linguists. Uh, their names were Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Worf. Uh, for them the question was whether thought and action um, are entirely determined by language, whether our thinking is unavoidably imprisoned by our native language. Um, 
do, our, do we always see the world through the lens of our native language? Or is the connection between um, the mind and language somehow less fixed? Well, most linguists nowadays um, think that uh, the strong version of this hypothesis doesn't hold. Um, if it did, such a simple thing as um, translation or translating would be basically impossible. Uh, we wouldn't be able to think outside of the categories of our native language. But many cognitive linguists still hold the, the softer version of that theory. And they agree on the notion that um, linguistic categories do influence the categories of um, thought. It's just that those categories are not fundamentally restrictive. Um, that is to say that some aspects of a language, some grammatical categories, uh, affect the way native speakers of that language perceive, categorize, remember and even think about the world. But we're not restricted by these categories, so when we learn to speak another language, um, we can learn and get used to other grammatical categories and their usage. But all in all, uh, linguistic relativism assumes that nearly all thought is done by, by means of the habitual and unconscious use of the basic categories provided by the native, lang uh, native language of a speaker. But here's an interesting question. Um, how do we know which way this cognitive process works? Um, for a considerable time, linguists have believed that it is the cognition, the way we experience the world, that influences the language. But the question is, um, is it possible that it could also be the other way around? That it is primarily our language that influences our thought and our mind? It is, is, it, is it plausible to assume that language can play a causal role in shaping our cognition? Or maybe these two influence, influence each other equally. Uh, maybe sh it's a two-way street. When we talk about things that abstract, um, obviously it's kind of hard to prove these kind of theories um, empirically. Um, but these questions have emerged just recent in the recent years um, in the circles of cognitive linguists. And uh, there are some recent studies which at least have given it a try in finding, finding an answer. I, I came across um, uh, with uh, a fascinating study um, and I briefly um, share this with you. For example, there are some interesting studies on grammatical gender and its possible influence uh, on how people think about objects um, of the world, inanimate objects, in languages which have the grammatical category of gender. Um, when we talk about gender in linguistic sense, um, we don't refer to biological gender, um, but we refer to a grammatical system where nouns are assigned a gender, which means that they change and they act in a sentence um, in a similar way. Um, so, in a sense, the word gender here is arbitrary. Um, it's just the way grammar has been described from ancient times. Um, these words or these objects around us are not feminine or masculine by themselves. But the question is whether people's mental representation of objects are actually influenced by grammatical genders assigned to these objects uh, in their language. Or in other words, um, does talking about inanimate objects as if they were masculine or feminine actually lead people to think of those objects as having a gender? And now we talk about the real gender, the biological gender. Um, there's a young researcher in 
the United States um, who has asked this question, does our language actually shape the way we think? Um, her name is uh, Lera Boroditsky. She is from uh, University of California. She's an, she's an associate professor of cognitive science there. And she ha she's one of those who has try to come up with some empiric empirical data in this area. So what she did was um, she got together a group of German and Spanish native speakers and German and Spanish are both languages with grammatical gender. Uh, and what they did was that they gave those uh, participants um, 24 objects with opposite grammatical gender in those languages. So they chose things uh, which, as nouns, as words, um, are of feminine gender in Spanish and masculine in German, or vice versa. Uh, and uh, the participants were asked to write down first three adjectives that came to mind to describe these objects. Really simple test, really. Um, and as the research team analyzed the results, they saw that they actually there were there were there were there were observable qualitative differences between the kind of adjectives the German-speaking people um, came up with compared to Spanish-speaking people, um, and this is quite fascinating. <laughs> For example, the word "key" is masculine in German and feminine. In Spanish. So German speakers, the, the ones who had the word being masculine in their language, uh, described keys with adjectives like hard, heavy, metal and useful, while Spanish speakers said that keys were golden, little, lovely, <laughs> shiny and tiny. <laughs> Um, obviously, it is a matter of interpretation. Um, That's Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but it does seem to suggest that there are some attributes or characteristics um, of these things that are more likely to be mentioned um, and which connect with the idea of real biological masculinity or, or femininity. Um, or another example, the word bridge, which is masculine in Spanish and feminine in German. So German speakers with the feminine word uh, used ad adjectives uh, like beautiful, elegant, fragile. How can a bridge be fragile? Well, no, peaceful, pretty and slender. While Spanish speakers were more likely to use words like big, dangerous, long, strong and towering. So that's quite interesting. <laughs> so, so the question was raised, does this mean that linguistic categories can actually alter non-linguistic representations? Do we see the world through the lens of our language? And just the possibility of having a two-way street, not only the world influencing our language or our mind, but actually our language influencing the way we see the world and we experience it, is um, it's a very interesting thought. And I think it can have a real, very um, practical application in several areas of life, which has to do with language and, uh, and thinking and their relationship to reality. Now, to paraphrase um, Tina Turner's famous song, what's God got to do with it? What has God got to do with our cognition and how it shapes our way of speaking? Or what has he got to do with the way our language shapes our thought and cognition? I personally think that the answer to this question is rather simple. Um, I think he's got everything to do with it. Because as human beings we cannot possibly separate 
God or disconnect God from words. And I'm speaking here as a linguist in that sense. We cannot separate him from the way we speak about him. Um, our knowledge, our experience of God inevitably has to take a lingual or a linguistic form. So in that sense, cognitive linguistics and, and theology have, um, they have a lot in common. Um, I guess only a direct revelation could possibly be free of the burden of the language. But um, as soon as it is communicated to a religious community, it necessarily has to be done through language. So whenever, whenever we talk about God, we, whenever we try to describe him, um, his nature or attributes, um, whenever we voice our experience as, uh, as spiritual people, we're stuck with language. Language is the only means we have. It's the only way we can share and shape our ideas of God. And this uh, stuckness has, um, has led theologians to reach rather pessimistic conclusions about language and its reach. The most pessimistic views claim um, that talking about God is inevitably idolatrous. Why? Because applying our concepts which get their form and meaning through our cognition and through our experience, applying these concepts to God, it's always misleading. And it always cuts God down to the size of our concepts. Or so the, so the argument goes. And furthermore, what makes the matter worse is, that, is the fact that the appropriate concepts and therefore the appropriate lingual forms used by religious communities tend to be shaped by those who occupy positions of power, both in the church and uh, in academia. So this idolatry often has the additional effect and it reinforces wider patterns of social marginalization which often exclude the voices of, of poor and downcast, of women or racial and ethnic minorities. So a whole lot of contemporary theologians um, have come to pessimistic conclusion stating that we can't really talk about God because our language is simply not fit for it. And even if we do it with our best intentions, we subconsciously do it in a way that fixes the thinking patterns of larger society. Such metaphysics, um, such equation of rea reality with our ideas about it, well, it naturally leads to the necessity of giving up on language itself when dealing with God. But as serious as this kind of um, flow of thought is in the academic discourse of philosophic the uh, theology, well, practically it is unattainable, as we are very well aware of. Our experience tells us that uh, we cannot write off language. We cannot possibly find a way around it. We can't give up on it. So I think the question isn't so much whether we can avoid language and thus the thinking patterns and social patterns of religious language. Um, but the practical question really is how could we be aware of and how could we take into account the limits of our language? And how can we be sure we don't forget the connection between our cognition and our language? including religious language. And I think the best we can do is um, to be aware of our limits, really. To step back for a second and, uh, and to think about what our language really does to us. And this is really, this is what has been my, um, 
my main goal for tonight to to remind ourselves of the capacity as well as the limitedness of our language and um, to evaluate the effect on us. Um, but I am convinced that um, it's not necessary to fall into despair and uh, give up on language altogether. When our goal is not some ideal correspondence between reality and words, um, especially divine reality and words, um, then words don't have to be perceived as inherently incorrect or as a violation of an ultimate reality. Words are just um, a communal ways of denoting parts of reality as we perceive them um, and um, connecting one's own habits with, uh, with perception of those of others in the same community. Um, but the question which we have to bear in mind and um, which we have to deal with perpetually is how and to what extent does our language affect our religious thinking and uh, what are the implications of the lingual forms we use when we talk about God. Those implications are important and um, I think they need to be thought over again and again and uh, I think really every generation has to do this hard work. Um, when we talk about universal tendency for human beings to be influenced by language and when we talk about God language influencing our perception um, and personal as well as social reality um, we find very quickly some topics and some areas of um, academic interest which uh, stand out and which uh, attract more attention than others. Um, and one of these themes or topics or issues which deal with God language and is closely tied with language and especially um, the grammatical category of gender is certainly the question of um, maleness of God. Um, we know that both Hebrew and Greek, the original languages of the scripture, have a gender distinction. And um, it is a well-known fact that uh, wherever God is being referred to with a personal pronoun, um, not with a proper name, but with a pronoun, it is always a masculine pronoun, he. Um, there are no exceptions to this rule in the, in, in the Bible. There is not one occasion in the Old Testament nor the New Testament where feminine pronoun uh, would be used to refer to God. Um, and the matter is a lot larger than just a question about a grammatical gender or one grammatical feature, um, because also names for God, um, both proper names and metaphorical names, the anthropomorphic uh, titles, the, the kinship titles, they are all lingual entities which affect our picture and our understanding of God and which reinforce a certain image of him. <laughs> it should be mentioned, <laughs> I, can't, I can't get around. <laughs> it should be mentioned that the names God has in the Old Testament um, in themselves um, do not have a gender association. And um, as Dr. Nochkula has pointed out um, in the latest New World publication, the gender associations um, arise from other associations around their names. So these associations, uh, metaphors, imagery in their specific lingual and grammatical form, they're all doing something to us. Um, they're all doing something to our thinking. Um, an author, um, Janet Soskis, a reader in philosophical theology at the University of Cambridge, whose um, speciality is religious language, um, says in her book, The Kindness of God, uh, these words, it is not possible to ignore questions of gendered imagery 
which have the deepest bearing on the lives of individuals and of their churches. And I like that saying a lot. I like that saying very much because she sees the deep connection between a lingual form that denotes gender and its effect and not only an effect on a personal level but also on a communal, on, on a church level, as she says. As the truth is that our faith and our spirituality is um, foremost a, a community, a communal thing. It is lived out and it gets its essence in a community. In that sense one could argue that uh, we also get our picture of God to a large extent from our church communities or faith communities. Um, and we, because these things have been verbalized in a certain way and we, we get their, the, the image in that way. Um, for one thing, Soskis talks about um, the anthropomorphic metaphors used to describe God in the Bible and, and the truth is they are mostly very masculine. But they are balanced with a relatively small number of, of feminine metaphors like giving birth or the metaphor of a nestling eagle or a nurturing mother. Um, and her focus is especially on the kinship terms. Father obviously being the most uh, prominent one. And she says that more than the word father says anything about any sort of um, hierarchy or dominance or subordination or anything about the masculine characteristics of God, the word father denotes the relational aspect of our connection to God. Um, to say that God is our father or to say that Jesus is our brother is to say that we are each other's kin and that's quite a you know, even for us sometimes it's quite a scandalous thought. And it's something that will never change. If you have a father, you are a son or a daughter. And there is nothing in this world that can ever change this fact. Or if you have a brother, you yourself are a sister or a brother. And whatever happens, there is no change in that fact. Um, kinship is not disposable, as Soskis points out. So, more than any gender-related association, calling God a father is ought to evoke feelings of, of security and remind us of kinship and, and salvation. Uh, this is, or it should be, the central idea of that metaphor. But what has happened over the, over the history of Christianity, um, this metaphor often has come to symbolize dominance or some sort of subordination and um, and in that sense it has crossed the limits of a metaphor. Its meaning has been expanded, expanded far beyond the central idea of a metaphor and um, sometimes you know it's turned into a downright sexist concept um, in a very literal way um, which does influence our understanding of God. Um, it's a metaphor that doesn't function as a metaphor anymore, but uh, more like a literal truth. And it does happen sometimes to metaphors, um, like it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a linguistic uh, fact in the sense. Uh, there are two linguists, uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, um, it's almost 30 years now uh, since they wrote a groundbreaking study on metaphors. Uh, the book is called Metaphors We Live By. And they talk about how they function, how our mind is soaked in metaphors and how they influence us in a very deep and very real way. And um, Lakoff and Johnson uh, say that uh, although metaphors are limited in their usage, when used excessively Metaphors can acquire the status of a truth, shaping our conceptual system in accordance with the metaphor.
So it can be that a metaphor ceases to function as a proper metaphor within its limits and it becomes a separate independent entity which I think has happened to many metaphors and images we use for God, including the way famous word father. It's taken way beyond the limits of, of a metaphoric or imagery language. Um, but thinking about the maleness and the, and the metaphor which has grown bigger uh, than a metaphor um, and the masculine pronoun he which we use, um, how does this one small linguistic feature, this masculine pronoun and therefore masculinity uh, on more universal level, uh, on a uh, universal scale, how does it affect our personal and communal understanding of God? How does this little linguistic feature, this tiny little word, um, shape our world? Um, they're very serious questions and obviously people have answered them in different, uh, different ways. Um, but probably the answer articulati articulated the clearest um, comes from feminist theology. And I mean, one can agree and disagree with uh, different aspects of feminist uh, approaches to different theological matters. But what is important in this context, um, in the context of this topic, is that um, feminist theology has a very clear and unambiguous answer to the question about the influence of certain lingual features to our understanding of God. Um, Mary Daly, in her classical work Beyond God the Father, puts it famously this way, if God is male, then male is God which does not focus so much um, on God's attributes, but rather its social and soci sociological applications for us. Uh, she says that speaking of God as father, doing it not bearing in mind the limitedness of metaphors, um, privileges human males over females, making the human males more godlike and therefore more powerful than females in society. Um, another feminist theologian, Sally McFaig, states, um, and I quote her here, the androcentric metaphors that form the principal imagery for God in the Western religious tradition return to us with divine sanction to legitimate the patriarchal world in which we live. Quite harsh words, really. Um, but the feminist theology sees a very clear and very um, direct correlation between our language and the social behavior or hierarchy it produces. If we use masculine language for God, then it reinforces a patriarchal, androcentric culture and uh, men get to dominate the society as well as uh, church. Um, the remedy the key to change the societal status quo um, would be to change the language, to change the grammar for God, um, <coughs> as uh, been sometimes suggested. This kind of feminist theology at its purest is um, it's a very interesting viewpoint and um, although I think it's a bit of an oversimplification sometimes to um, uh, to say these things uh, from from a purely linguistic viewpoint. Um, I really appreciate the fact that that this matter has been brought up, and the possible impact of a certain grammatical form to our cognition has been pointed out. Janet Soski says, when we change the gender of a term we change the relationship. And from cognitive linguistics viewpoint, it's certainly true. Change the word, change the lingual form, and you change something in cognition, in your mind, in your perception. Um, do we need to change the gender of the term we use for God? <laughs> 
or should we do it? And obviously the big theological question here is, could we? Like, are we allowed? Are we free to do that? And I'm purposefully <laughs> not attempting to answer this question tonight. But I just want to raise it. Should we do it or could we do it? What would happen if we did? What would change in our mind if we changed the language? What would God be like then? Would he be any different? Um, I think there's a lot of questions and um, um, less answers at this point. And what I like um, about this particular issue is that it has not stayed within the limits or borders of um, academic theological discussion. Um, I mean, it has gone far beyond it. Um, this topic has been tackled by literature and different art forms, and I think increasingly so in recent years. There have been several occasions where the grammatical form and also visual imagery for God has been deliberately changed. And I haven't heard of any studies um, attempting to sort of measure objectively an impact of such a, such a change to people's picture of God. I don't know even if it could be done. But even from a pers personal experience, um, I can say that there is something to it. It does change something in the mental picture when a grammatical form or a visual representation has been changed. Um, and there are many examples of it. Um, William Paul Young, um, in his best-selling novel The Shack, for example, describes God the Father as a big black lady. And there in his book he also uses the, the feminine uh, pronoun for God. Well, just recently we all saw the record keeper, the shaking of Adventism, <laughs> which, did the, which did the same thing visually. Um, and in the end, and I think my time is over soon, I want to come back to where I started and say that in this sense, Alice Walker in The Colour Purple has even taken a step further um, he's bringing up the, the, the racial issue there as well. But um, she's almost becoming sort of animistic in her approach as she uses a neutral pronoun for God, calling God it, and suggesting um, through the mouth of her character that one should think about wind and flowers and big rocks and water when trying to picture God. And well, in English language, these are the things that we use a pronoun it. <coughs> so, when we read such literature and when we watch those movies, then um, really the question is, what does it do to us? What does it do to our imagery? And also, what does it do to our feelings? Um, I think it's a fascinating job subject and, and I'm, I'm really glad there are brave people out there who force us to face these questions and who make us deal with them, um, either from an academic or, or um, an artistic viewpoint. And I really haven't taken it to be my goal to analyze the rightness or wrongness of such activity or to judge it or anyone in that sense or any way, but uh, just to point out the, the, the complexity of the issue from, from linguists viewpoint. So for me really the, the, the whole point of this evening or this talk has been to raise questions and to make us um, ask certain questions occasionally. We rarely ever think about our language and most of it happens under the surface um, subconsciously. But I think it's sometimes good for us to, to consider these things. And um, 
if I may finish on a very personal note, then um, I've been in a place in my life where I asked God to be my mother, um, in a metaphorical sense, and I think uh, metaphors should be continuously used as metaphors. But I did that. Did it change something in my head? Did it change something in the way I relate to God? It did. And that's the power of language. So thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Um, these were my thoughts on the subject. Thank you very much. <laughs>